So our next speak <coughs> speaker is Holger uh, Bersig. He's a principal scientist at the Institute for In Vitro Sciences. Um, he has experience with numerous in vitro and ex vivo toxicology model systems, as well as a background in the use of pulmonary models. Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak here. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure. I'm just down the road in Gaithersburg, so uh, I'm not too far away. Uh, I know we have two talks on in vitro models, uh, and I will be giving you an overview of all the different types of in vitro models that you may wish to actually uh, use when it comes to ENDS testing. Uh, and so I'll start by talking about the in vitro toxicology approach at IIVS, what we do. Uh, I'll talk about some uh, adverse respiratory events, uh, use cigarette exposure and examples of some models there, uh, and then the pragmatic use of some of those models that are available, uh, because I don't think that they're all being used as, as good as they can be uh, used. Uh, exposure systems are going to be really important. Uh, and then certainly, uh, just one slide on the opportunity that we have uh, with, uh, with uh, the testing of ENDS. So IIVS, we're a nonprofit, uh, and we really focus on the science, education, and outreach uh, for the increased use and acceptance of uh, non-animal methods. Uh, and we've got a lot of experience doing that. Uh, and so you know, we participated in a number of different ECVAM studies, uh, ECVAM validation, method validations, um, OECD expert groups, uh, et cetera. And so uh, we know what it means when you have a standardized assay and, and how much that can afford the industry uh, that needs to have an assay to uh, determine uh, if there's toxicities or, or risk. Uh, I mentioned we do uh, 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 have an educational component. Uh, and so we have workshops. In fact, we've already had three workshops on tobacco-related uh, uh, systems that can be evaluated in in vitro models. Uh, the first was two years ago, uh, in vitro COPD models uh, for tobacco regulatory science. Uh, and those conclusions actually led us to uh, a technical workshop. So we don't just want to disseminate the information. Uh, we want to make that rubber meet the road. Uh, and that's what happens in those technical workshops. And so right now we actually have an ongoing effort uh, where we're looking at goblet cell hyperplasia, mucus production, and ciliary beating assays to see if these assays have merit. Uh, and want to develop a standardized assay, uh, if possible, uh, that everybody has at their disposal. The most recent workshop we had uh, was last April, uh, and we just heard about how complicated it can be to really understand the exposure to symmetry, and, and that's one of the uh, uh, main topics that we, we focused on there. Uh, and um, you know, there'll be there'll be more workshops. So, what does a standardized, validated assay provide? It's a common mechanism available to the industry to, to generate data. Uh, and when you have credible data, uh, that means you have weight of ev evidence that regulators can use for decision-making processes. Um, and, and certainly, you know, this is uh, kind of a system that's validated will benefit a wide range of industries. We're talking about ENDS here today, but uh, imagine all of those other industries where there may be pulmonary exposure risks. Having a, a validated assay there uh, will definitely serve them as well. So one slide on a, a very rough overview of what's out there. I think when we hear about cell culture, we're very aware of the cell lines uh, that can be uh, immortalizing you know, cancer cells or, or transformed cells. Uh, and then we have the primary cells, which are generally considered to be a, a bit better. Uh, those are both um, 2D uh, type uh, cell uh, systems. And then we have the organoids, the spheroids, uh, those 3D tissues that you hear a lot about when you go to, to various meetings. Uh, and, and those are all, um, you know, Quite, quite interesting and, and, and have a lot of power when it comes to determining different types of toxicities, certainly when it comes to multiple cell types. There are ex vivo tissues, uh, precision cut lung size. That's something I have a bit of a background with. Uh, and then, of course, there's the chip technologies, and we hear a lot about these. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about those so much. In fact, I'm going to be focusing on the 3D uh, cultures and tissues. I know that the new technologies are coming out there, but it's not like I can call up the WIS Institute and say, hey, I need two dozen uh, of these, you know, um, uh, pulmonary models that you have. So it's not quite there yet, but uh, definitely some exciting things happening. Well, there's a lot of different endpoints that we can look at when it comes to uh, 2D models and, and 3D models. Uh, certainly mutagenicity, cell stress, cytotoxicity, uh, inflammation, and even more complex models. Uh, Dr. Mariana Gatza will be uh, speaking next, and she's going to give you some, some really good data um, uh, looking at some of these endpoints. So when we think about uh, what happens when you have an exposure. Uh, we'll probably start with an initiating event, which ends up being a tissue response, uh, tissue effects, and then pulmonary uh, effects. But before we even get to a mammalian uh, cell model, uh, we want to use predictive tools. And, and that's where the in silico comes in. Uh, we can do an in chemical uh, assay, such as the uh, DPRA, or direct peptide reactivity assay, uh, to see if there is maybe a threat. 
Uh, and then we can go into those tissues that we have. Uh, and, and certainly you can see here that uh, the, the, the 2D tissues, uh, they, they stretch perhaps uh, up to a tissue response. Uh, once you have 3D and you have multiple cell types, it take you all the way to tissue effects. Uh, and then and certainly when you come to ex vivo, you've got a lot of different cell types that will uh, push the bar even further uh, where perhaps you can look at pulmonary effects. And what you see up there are really just some examples. Uh, it certainly is not comprehensive. Well, before we even start vaping, what's happening? We have uh, individuals mixing e-liquids, right? Uh, and therefore, you may have a hand, um, you know, skin exposure, you may have uh, ocular exposure, uh, and there already are some really nice three models out there. In fact, I kind of refer to these as regulatory tox success stories because they're, they're used extensively uh, on an international level. Uh, you know, the European uh, uh, cosmetics uh, prerogative, uh, they, they basically say no more animal testing. So it needs to happen using in vitro. Well, let's see, we are vaping now. Um, what is there that may be available uh, that we can use to, to look at the different areas of, of sites of exposure? Uh, well, we can start with a model like uh, epioral or epigingival, which are uh, oral um, cavity models uh, when you begin that vape. Uh, and then you're going to have that, uh, that, that, that uh, vapor and aerosol travel down uh, where epi airway and mucil air can model that the trachea uh, and also um, on the, the bronchial area. Of course, you can exhale through your nose, and then there are models as well from, from the uh, uh, nasopharynx uh, origin. But very recently, uh, both Epithelix, uh, uh, who created small air and Matech, uh, created epi alveolar. And so uh, these are new model systems uh, that, that have come out uh, maybe a year or two ago. Uh, really exciting that we now have a deep lung model. Uh, so we definitely need to do some more work there. Well, let me kind of highlight the way I see uh, the use of these air liquid interface models. Uh, uh, and, and it's really neat because you actually have that apical space where you can conduct an, uh, a physiological-like exposure. Uh, then you have the, uh, the tissue uh, below that, uh, that uh, apical space. And by the way, these, these, these tissues create mucus. Because when we think about uh, when you vape and you, you inhale, that's the first thing that is exposed. And then uh, the resulting mixture of, of your mucus, which has a lot of detoxifying components in it, uh, that, that will then actually trigger responses from the cells. Um, and, uh, and, and below these air-liquid air interface cultures, you have the medium. Uh, and this is a 3D model. Uh, and I see very often that researchers are using them like 2D models, where they'll look just in that medium uh, for cytokines uh, or other biomarkers. Uh, but uh, in reality, you know, maybe looking in, uh, you should be looking in the apical surface, because that's where the exposure is. And we know that when people um, you know, have uh, an ailment in the, in the respiratory tract, uh, that's where the action is, in the airway itself. In fact, we did a study a couple of years ago where we wanted to see, you know, when we have a, uh, a, a toxicant. Now, you can see here we use poly-IC, which is a viral mimetic uh, molecule, and we also have lipopolysaccharide, a pro-inflammatory agent. And we went ahead and said, okay, well, when we expose that apical surface, where is that response? And, and sure enough, it was really in the apical space where we saw a tremendous uh, increase over negative control, in fact, 18-fold. Now, if you look at the medium, uh, we had about a 2.8-fold uh, increase over negative control, and that really isn't too exciting uh, when it comes to uh, a large uh, uh, inflammatory response. Well, what about the slices? Uh, precision cut lung slices is something I've been doing for about uh, 13 years or so, uh, and it, I think the, the way that the slices are created is largely conserved. So you, you fill the lung with an agar solution, you allow it to gel, uh, you make a section uh, from that lung, uh, you essentially make little uh, cylinder cores. Uh, those cores are then placed into a precision cut slicer, and then you make slices. And that's where things can radically change between the different laboratories that are doing slice work. So I was taught to use the roller system, and you can kind of see that, that roller drum and the incubator down there uh, where you have a, a small vials in there, simulation vials actually, that have a small amount of medium, and you have that slice turning at a very low rate of, of, of speed. Uh, and that allows that slice to be kind of call it like a sponge bath, so it's getting medium kind of uh, that runs all over it. It never actually submerges uh, into that medium, but uh, it gives this, this really nice medium and air interface uh, that, that seems to do well for the sizes. Now, just a quick search online when I was looking at the different labs that are publishing on this, I saw, I think it was four different basal medium types. Uh, and again, you know, imagine if you, if we all got the same results, that's great. You know, what, what's the regulator going to think? Wow, this is a nice system where you can uh, look at these responses. But what if the results are different? Is it because of the, the different methods that we use to actually culture them or the different basal medium? 
uh, things get very complicated here. We want a standardized system where we know that you know, when we use that same system and we compare results, uh, we can do so. Well, slices uh, cannot be made from the larger airways. So uh, you do have some limitations. Our slices are eight millimeters in diameter. Uh, and so um, you, know, you're, you're, you have those constraints. But it's usually going to be in the small airways and the parenchyma where a lot of the uh, prominent diseases uh, manifest. And so that's uh, no, not necessarily a bad thing. There you can see a photomicrograph of a slice that we made uh, in our laboratory. And you can see that you, know, you have that entire parenchyma. You get those small airways coursing through that slice itself. And, that, and that's a fantastic thing. So you have those other 3D ALI cultures, but you might have three or four and maybe five cell types there. Here you have them all, at least all of those that were uh, present in the core when you did the slicing. Uh, here is an example of some human PCLS. This is work I did uh, a number of years back. Um, as a grantee uh, or, or received an award from the National Cancer Institute uh, when I was at SRI International. And we were looking at uh, some human PCLS. We were looking at uh, acute toxicity. I, I consider acute toxicity anything less than a week of exposure. Uh, and so you can see clearly that the immunoflavin prodrug uh, caused a lot of uh, destruction by day seven. Uh, and to the right, you can see that uh, the slice content of IL-1 beta, uh, a really nice concentration response. Already within one day, you see a response. Uh, that's nicely conserved uh, still at day three. Uh, and uh, the cytokine response kept dropping, that, but by day seven, we saw that very overt damage that you see there. Well, we can do long-term cultures with sizes too. And this, this takes me back to what I was just saying about uh, the different culture systems, the different basal media. Uh, very often, you'll read about slices only being viable for three, four, five, maybe six days. Uh, well, we took our cultures out to uh, 28 days uh, in that roller culture. Um, uh, we did have some loss of cellularity in, in the parenchyma space, but you can see those airways are uh, very, very well conserved. Uh, and and what, one thing that's nice about these slices is that you actually have that native architecture. And we had the benefit of having a pathologist actually evaluate the tissue for us. Uh, of course, we looked at uh, slice biomarkers themselves. Uh, we did have about a 50% uh, drop of protein over those 28 days. Uh, the ALP was uh, largely conserved, and the LDH appears like it's going up, but uh, uh, both ALP and, uh, and LDH are normalized to the protein content, so that might explain why that LDH is, uh, is moving up. Well, we always like to compare the biochemical values with the histology. And here to the, on the right, you can see uh, the viability. We have the alveolar spaces uh, in, in kind of an orange uh, or yellow, uh, and then you have the bronchioles uh, that were also scored by the pathologist in green. And you can see we have over 60, 65 percent viability uh, by day 28. <laughs> But what's really exciting here uh, is the little pink bar that you see in front, and that is the existence or the maintenance of um, activated macrophages for that entire length of time. Um, and here we see a photomicrograph uh, of uh, uh, control at day seven, and the top right we have carmistine, otherwise known as BCNU at day seven, definitely more macrophages uh, that are activated in, in that uh, field. And you look at the bottom left, gliomyosin, the, 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 the uh, the reference material that so many researchers use when it comes to pulmonary damage um, uh, is also causing an increase of those macrophages. But not only that, but you can see what it looks, it appears that those macrophages are actually filling into those alveolar spaces, perhaps scavenging debris. Not sure uh, what's happening there, but there's some really exciting things uh, that happen when you have a longer term culture, when you have activated macrophages, uh, and then you might even have effects such as collagen deposition. So uh, this is definitely a hallmark of fibrosis, uh, and, uh, and it's really exciting to see that in these, uh, in these you know, PCLS. And so we're definitely going to do some work uh, in, the, um, uh, in the near future looking more at the long-term culture uh, and some of those tissue changes that we, that, uh, that we can detect, not just collagen deposition. There's all kinds of other changes <coughs> that are hallmarks of disease progression. Well, we have those models, but now uh, we, we need to expose them, right? So at the top, you see an image of a pipette tip where they're just dropping a small volume to that apical surface. That's great, but if we want to model ENDS exposures, we're going to be, we need to expose a lot. Uh, and, you, and you can't create a hypoxic environment there by continually exposing all day long. And what you see below uh, is actually a collaborative project that IIDS has with uh, Hewlett Packard and TCAN. Uh, it's a digital dispenser. Think of an inkjet printer, but it actually prints DMSO in very, very small volumes. And what you can see here uh, in the, uh, the image with the, with the red dots, those are three nanometer droplets. Uh, we can get much smaller than that. I had to make them three nanometers, otherwise you can't see them, right? Um, I found out that I can actually uh, coordinate that dispense on top of the ALI uh, tissue itself. 
Uh, and on the right there, the fluorescence, you can see that with all those cilia that are moving uh, and then that mucus flare, it is quickly distributed so you have an even exposure uh, right there. So, however, if we're going to do a real exposure, uh, we would need something like a smoke engine or an aerosol generator. Uh, and there are a number of them out there, uh, but they all use a very similar concept. If you look at the, the, the top middle uh, picture, you can see that flute coming down. You can see that uh, you have that exposure coming down, hitting that apical surface, and then being exhausted off. Well, it's probably the most relevant, and definitely is the most relevant, uh, but we have um, uh, dosimetry issues. We just heard about that. What's actually getting to that surface? Uh, and that is definitely a challenge. On the top right, you can see that we have a vitreous cell quartz crystal microbalance. Uh, definitely can measure the mass um, that's deposited there, but there's still a lot of questions that we have. In fact, that third workshop that I just mentioned that we had last April uh, focused uh, on that. Well, e-cigarette research is an opportunity. Um, we need to standardize the assays so we can look at the biological response, <coughs> not mix the test system uh, um, utility or, or its pros and cons with, with the biological response. There are, is a seemingly infinite combination of e-cigarette constituents, uh, and we can't screen that using animal models, so we need to bring these in vitro systems in there uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, we can create a, a tiered, cost-effective, and highly informative approach, uh, and, and let's get those standardized systems out there, because uh, there's, there's a lot to be learned. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Your, your point about standardizing uh, these tests is very important. What has been done with either air liquid interface cultures or uh, tissue slice, lung tissue slices with cigarette smoke condensate and how would one go about doing a comparison uh, as we've heard today lots of times of comparing to cigarette smoke uh, so that you have some positive control to compare with? Uh, that's, uh, that's a good question uh, and there's definitely some inherent differences between those models. Obviously when you have your lung slice it is a cross cut through that section, right? So we don't have that, that just an airway being exposed. Uh, now uh, there has been work uh, done by, for example, the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. Uh, they they uh, have a, the Prit Expo cube uh, that I had up there as an exposure system, and they will actually take slices and put them, uh, place them on an air liquid interface, do that exposure there, uh, which is exactly the way that you would do it with, uh, uh, with you know, one of those 3D reconstructed airway models as well. Uh, and in terms of the different condensates and, and things that have been tried there, I keep hearing bits and pieces from the various tobacco reachers I in, interact with. Uh, and it, it seems that in terms of slices, they're still kind of trying them out. Uh, they're still saying, well, how does this work? Uh, I'll hear about uh, the tissue actually changing based on being submerged or uh, one side has the air and the bottom has the medium and it, it, you know, you're, you're, you're creating a situation for the tissue there that's non-native. I just have one question. So I think with a particular concern of, of our group, would be to assess the long term, the chronic effects of using electronic cigarettes and make some conclusions, what we know. So what can you comment about the different systems that you present and, and how, what would we need to be careful when we assess the data from the acute exposure over like a few puffs were taken and how we can extrapolate the effects to the chronic effects? Well, you know, that's uh, definitely a question I don't necessarily have an, uh, a perfect answer to. Uh, I, I think that a lot of these things are, are still exploratory in some sense. Uh, definitely you can get a lot of answers from, uh, you know, the 2D models that, uh, that Mariana will be speaking about uh, soon. But um, that, that's still something that we need to address. Uh, just like uh, I mentioned, and in fact I recall uh, you were at our, at our workshop for exposure to asymmetry. Uh, and definitely one initiative I, I'd like to take is, is actually compare those uh, 3D models, those airway models with slices. Uh, just the different complement of cells and the slices versus the 3D models uh, will, will hopefully uh, show us what one uh, system is capable of versus the other when it comes to something like an inflammatory response. But both of those models can go out months, uh, at least a month with slices, uh, perhaps longer. Hi, I had a quick question. Um, so you can look at sort of inflammatory responses. You showed that nicely. But can you use those pre precision cut lung slices to look at any functional outcomes like, you know, reactivity in the small airways? Yeah, actually that, that's also a great question. Uh, I know I reviewed a, a manuscript a, a couple of years ago where uh, sheet lungs were being used for con uh, contractility of the airway uh, studies. Uh, in fact, uh, we're uh, in, in talks with a couple of researchers at Harvard right now 
uh, who are using uh, lung slices uh, for uh, bronchoconstriction as well. Uh, and so there's definitely uh, functionality there. I know the Fraunhofer researcher that, uh, that we know, uh, she has talked about actually she's also seeing beating cilia uh, in those airways uh, in, in, in the slices. So um, I, I see the, 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 uh, yeah, everything wide open in terms of what we can still explore when it comes to the slices. Slices are a, kind of an art to make. Uh, not everybody uh, uh, can do them right away. There's definitely some training. Uh, and, uh, but when you get good at it, you can get really, really good answers from them. Thank you.